Nicholas Johnson is best known for his controversial term as a dissenting FCC commissioner during the Johnson-Nixon era. His book from that time, How to Talk Back to Your Television Set, is just as relevant today as it was back then, even during the Internet age, with its critique of media consolidation and the manufacturing of news. He currently teaches at the University of Iowa College of Law with an emphasis on communications and Internet law. And since 2006, he has posted more than 1,000 blog essays. He is included in the Yale Biographical Dictionary of American Law as one of 700 leading figures in the history of American law from the colonial era to the present day. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Nicholas Johnson. Thank you. Good to be here. Welcome indeed, Nick. And I know you know a lot about social media and the Internet, and I once hosted a program on public radio called High Tech Times. But this hour wants to focus on the traditional media. And so I want you to sort of educate us about the 1934 Communications Act when radio came on before TV. And of course, it applies to TV. And then we're going to talk about the chairman of the Federal Communications Committee, right commission, right out of the industry, Ajit Pai, and what is happening to shut out the American people from their own views and their own concerns on the property that they own, public airwaves, and to rig these cable franchise agreements so that the cable companies control who gets on and who doesn't and charges what they want. So that's a big agenda, but nobody can streamline it better than you. So let's start with the Federal Communications Act of 1934 and what it requires. Okay, and then after we deal with all these subjects, what are we going to teach in the class the next semester? <laughs> right. Let me begin with some preliminaries, if I may, and I'll be as brief as I can. I think it's important to make the point that the FCC and the Communications Act are not just one other regulatory agency. They are dealing with, when it comes to media, one of the most fundamental pillars of a democracy. And when we mess around with that, we lose what America is really all about. And it's a shame to miss that. And I think another thing to say at the outset is that other countries went about this much more intelligently than we did, because I guess Lord Reith and the BBC would have been the first, but others followed, NHK and Sverdjus Radio in Sweden and, and others. And they were prescient enough to see that capitalism should play no role in anything as important as broadcasting to the people of their countries. And interestingly, a lot of Lord Reith's ideas were in fact shared not only by, I was only president of the United States, Herbert Hoover, who was then serving as Secretary of Commerce, but by many of the broadcasters as well. Hoover said, it is inconceivable that we should allow so great a possibility for service, for news, entertainment, education, to be drowned in advertising chatter. And even the National Association of Broadcasters supported that idea at the time of the 1934 Act. And Congress was very prescient about the dangers of media ownership, which is amazing back at a time when a radio receiver was a magic box and people couldn't figure out how the little tiny humans got inside there. Congressman Luther Johnson warned his colleagues at the time. He said, American thought and politics will be at the mercy of those who operate these stations. If placed in the hands of a single selfish group, then woe be to those who dare to differ with them. And that, of course, is exactly what we're uh, dealing with now. Right across the border, the Canadians did it differently, too. They have CBC, a state-owned television network. They also allow private television networks, but only in America have we given up the public airways to fewer and fewer giant media conglomerates like Fox and Sinclair buying up all kinds of properties, including newspapers and radio stations. So what are the requirements that apply today? that the chairman of the FCC, Ajit Pai, is not 
paying attention to in terms of standards, public trust? Well, let me just say on that before I get to Pi, just to finish this out, that the Act began, the 34 Act began, it is the purpose of this Act to maintain the control of the United States over all the channels of radio transmission and to provide for the use of such channels, but not the ownership thereof. The use, but not the ownership. So that's the source of the expression, the public owns the airwaves. I mean, it's almost as if the broadcasters were government employees, except we kept this unfortunate element of capitalism. The FCC told the licensees where they could build, how much minimum and maximum hours of operation they could have, their transmitter's power, the direction of their signals, limits on how many licensees they could hold, the maximum amount of advertising they could have, and the minimums of educational and cultural programming, news, public affairs, public service announcements that they had to provide, so that what the broadcasters had was worthless equipment until they had a license. And the license was only good for three years when I was on the commission. And what they applied as the standard, according to the Act, is, quote, the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Well, by now, it hasn't just been pie. This has been going on for a long time. But, you know, he's got a background in working with Republican political programs in the Senate, primarily. Uh, He represented Verizon. And then he's been in the culture of the FCC, which has been decidedly non-regulatory. I thought it was horrible when I was there. I wrote some 400 individual opinions describing how awful the FCC was. Now we look back on the 60s that the FCC is the golden age of responsible regulation. That's right. (laughs) So Pi was kind of seeped in this culture before he was put on the commission and then made chairman, but he has something on his webpage that makes him sound like your twin brother. But you look at what he's actually done, he's opposed net neutrality, notwithstanding the hundreds of American citizens who wrote in supporting it. He seems to be all in favor of giving Sinclair even more television stations. This is the outfit that supplies its local stations with must-carry hard right-wing commentary that they have to play on the station as if it was local news. And with this merger, they're going to have access to 72% of American homes. In my day, we limited them to five VHF stations and then another two UHF stations they could have. That was the maximum. Now we're talking about radio owners with over a 1,000 stations and Sinclair They have hundreds of television stations, and that itself is just a terrible hazard to the values of the First Amendment and its role in making democracy possible. So Pi, unfortunately, has not been good news. He's also making his decisions by dictate, by a kind of FCC executive order, which may be challengeable in court. But On issue after issue, he's against the audience. He's for the big broadcast syndicates and corporations. It's so consistent. The only time he's pushed back on Trump is when Trump threatened to take the licenses away from these companies that allowed criticism of Trump. He said, well, that's not the way it's done. But let me inform our listeners of this uh, speech by one of your predecessors, Newton Minowa, was nominated to be the chairman of the FCC under John Kennedy, President John Kennedy. And one of the first things he did in 1961 was give a speech to the broadcast industry in a big ballroom, and he called television, quote, a vast wasteland, end quote, shook up the industry. But as you say, television today compared to television then I mean, it's gotten so much worse when you turn on the TV Saturday afternoon. Is this what's going on in America? You know, bicycles flipping in the air, infomercials about certain cutlery and kitchens that you can get, 
uh, grade C movie repeats, and on and on. And daytime talk radio, there's no more Phil Donahue and the important issues he brought to the public. There's no more Michael Jackson in radio in uh, Los Angeles. It's gotten so much worse. Can you comment on this? I mean, what kind of price are we paying in this country? for this trash, this trivia? Well, we're we're paying a terrible price. And as I put it, when I was on the commission, it's not even the evil that the television industry does, as bad as that is in terms of encouraging consumption and portraying, defining the role of women. But it's what they fail to do. When you consider it's a evil of nonfeasance, When you consider that the average toddler today, by the time they're five years old, will have spent more hours watching television and other screens than the number of hours they will later spend in a college classroom earning a B.A. degree. And as I've said, all television is educational television. The only question is, what is it teaching? And it certainly is not teaching the values of a democratic society with the information that citizens need. I did some writing about the ABC Evening News. The Evening News, I've decided it's become the National Enquirer of television. There's none of what Americans need in order to function in a democratic society with the information provided that they need. And when you consider that the average toddler, by the time they're five years old, will have spent more hours watching television and other screens than the number of hours they'll spend in a college classroom earning a B.A. degree, you got to ask, what are they learning? Because, as I've said, all television is educational television. The only question is, what is it teaching?